And without further ado, I would like to hand over the floor to Dr. Michael Jerison. Thank you for that very warm introduction. Uh, I, I want to thank SGA, uh, the students who, who voted for this, and for, for YSU for hosting this. It's a wonderful opportunity, I think, for faculty to, to deliberate over a topic of their choosing. Um, you seldom get that option. You're told what classes you teach and when you teach them. Um, so it's just nice to have that freedom. Now, um, I'd like to begin, if I can, with a, a short story. Uh, for those who take my classes, you might know I like to tell stories. Um, and I can't resist starting with one of these. So, a while ago, there was an old man who was working in a factory. And they expected the old man is stealing. Every day, when the old man walked out with his wheelbarrow, they checked to make sure if anything was in it, checked his pockets, checked to see what was behind him. They could find nothing. Week after week, they stopped and checked the old man. Again, same thing, empty wheelbarrow, nothing was in there. And it took months until the other shoe dropped they realized he was stealing wheelbarrows. <laughs> now, I give you this story because it's, it encourages us to look at things in a different perspective. I especially think it's helpful when thinking about our lives. We can focus on parts of our lives, the details in our day-to-day -day encounters, and miss what's right in front of us. Um, now, I realize with the various ways to approach a last lecture series that one way is for professors to consider what they would lecture on if it was their last day or time at YSU. Another way of considering this event is to invite professors to consider the impermanence of life, that we are all in the process of dying, and what would they like to say if they were going to die shortly thereafter. I have elected to pursue this latter mindset. And it's a bit traumatic having to do that, <laughs> but I've done so. And just as the mystery of the old man requires a different perspective, I've chosen for my last lecture to invite you to consider a different look, a different perspective on life through contemplating death. And uh, I just want to give some trigger warnings. Some of these images and photos might be disturbing. The first image I had at the beginning um, comes from my field work, uh, where I was working and living in southern Thailand. Um, so if certain images startle you, I apologize in advance, but it's a trigger warning for those who might get disturbed by those. There's been a long tradition within Buddhist traditions contemplating death. Um, the idea would be, early on, too, that Buddhists would go on to crematorial areas, cemeteries, sit there amongst the skeletons and bones, and meditate on dying. That would be horrid, right, thinking about this. Uh, over time, it got less dramatic, less traumatic, but still to this day, there's traditions where they'll do this on a daily level meditate on the process of dying. When I first learned about this, I thought it was a little strange. Why think about the decomposition of our bodies? I mean, it said that Tenzin Gyatso, the 14th Dalai Lama, he does this every day. He begins his morning thinking about this. How gradually the life forces in his body will begin to drain from him. Now, psychologists, interesting enough, have found that this is a healthy practice. Who'd have thought, right? Thinking about that is a healthy practice. It helps one cope with life and the traumas they're in. And what's interesting, I found, there's so many thinkers, so many important influential scholars and writers throughout the Western world that have echoed this importance about thinking about death. I'll just give you a few as examples. Now, 
Uh, Sigmund Freud, whom I know is highly disliked by many of my students here at YSU, uh, is one of the founders of modern psychology. He theorized that the only instinct that gives Eros, the libido, a run for its money, is the Thanatos drive, uh, commonly referred to as the death drives. Everyone, in his view, is driven by a death instinct. Day to day, all the time, we're driven by this at a subconscious level. And we have various drives towards death and destruction. Now here, the death drive does not run counter to our libido, our sex drive, which I always hear people talk about Freud and sex, and oh, it's, you know, the pen is just a pen sometimes, but he talked a lot about death too. Um, but the death drive actually twists the promises of life and reminds us of other things that are relatable to the human psyche and libido. And death is no small subject. It terrifies us, it haunts us, and yet we are drawn to it. This year's horror movies are no exception to the rule. I just pulled some examples just from this year alone. Um, now, what is a horror movie but that which twists the promises of life, reminds us the impermanence of death? But we seek it out through these movies, through stories, and visits to haunted houses. There's something there. Now, I'm not really a horror movie kind of person, but obviously there's a consumption level here, otherwise they wouldn't exist. Another important scholar writing about death, Georges Bataille, a famous French intellectual who contributed to philosophy, economics, sociology, art history, to name a few, liked to play in the dark and mysterious and at times unsavory aspects of human life. And he built upon Freud's work and argued that we are drawn to death and to sex, that both of these provide a means of experiencing something beyond ourselves. And here Bataille links death to our largest drive, which for him is continuity. He argues that in the beginning, we experience discontinuity in a very traumatic way through birth, when we are pushed out of our mother's womb, where we used to feel connected, and suddenly we feel apart. And he argues that the rest of our lives we're searching for a way to get reconnected to something beyond ourselves, this thirst for continuity. And so in many ways, sex is a way of trying to feel connected to someone else, getting beyond oneself. He talks a lot about this, but also he talks about death as a way of uniting us. In the end, we all do this. Martin Heidegger, one of the most eminent and contested philosophers of the 20th century, ruminated on our processes of existence. He argues that we have fallen into this life that was well underway. There's so much happened prior to us being born that we're catching up with. And we're being thrust forward constantly towards the future in which we will not be able to share. In short, we are having a crisis of reconciling our own finitude, that we're finite. We've limited time here. And this absorbs our consciousness all the time. And this is the, the premise more or less of his book, Being in Time, on Dasein. It's a work of existentialism, for example. He's, he talks about this being a primary push here. And one can pursue this idea of reconciling finitude through the lens of institutional religion. Some scholars identify religion by its means of reconciling our own mortality, much like what we find in Buddhist practices, whether it's afterlife, this is with Christianity, uh, Islam, Hinduism, Egyptian Buddhism, Norse, Chinese religion. All of them deal with or reconcile the limited time we have on this earth. Now, by providing these examples, I hope to underscore the importance and values that others have given to talking about death. And I don't wish to reject these ideas they've given, or the theories I've outlined. Rather, I wish to highlight a different way of thinking about our fears about death. Because I think that all three of these great thinkers, which are all men, I recognize that too. I'm looking at a lot of white men here, um, are looking at 
not contesting that we have a fear of death, but why do we have a fear of death? And what does it make us do? And my suggestion is to think that, of it this way, that death is a natural process. And the only thing that actually terrifies us is our consciousness's inability to conceive of its own non-existence. It's like a computer trying to think of not being a computer, going beyond its programming. There's an error. So it's the inability to understand that terrifies us, not the act of death itself. Now, death is always a possibility for us. When people close to us die, it's an intimate reminder of our own mortality. I think this is part of the grieving process, is us also processing the fact that it can happen to us too. Western society, I think, in this current age, is particularly poor at dealing with this inevitability. Most families do not visit and discuss plans for where some what, what plans for what someone will do when they die, or to decide upon funeral homes if they want to, until someone has died. I would urge you not to do this. I mean, again, we're all going to die. Why not have the conversation when you're least traumatized to do it, to make those decisions? Now, in many ways, I would say I participate in this avoidance of death, not wanting to talk about it, not thinking about it all the time, until I did my research uh, for my doctoral degree in Southern Thailand. Now, back in 2003, I was living in Thailand when the violence broke out in its southernmost provinces, and it's still going on today. It doesn't get a lot of news. I wanted to learn about Buddhist monks, how they were affected by the violence, and also how the violence was affecting them on a day-to-day -day level. And I knew I couldn't wait until after the violence to ask them how they're reacting to this hor horrific events because, one, it's hard to reflect later on how you're feeling. And two, you have the onus, the pressure as a Buddhist monk to say, oh, I wasn't that affected by it. I had this calm, peaceful veneer. So I thought the best way to find out this information was to go down there to the conflict zone, to live with them day in and day out, and observe what's happening. Now, I used empathy was against it. Don't go down there. Um, I was one of, I think, of only three people, um, foreigners in the area at the time. But I went there. And today, still, there are daily bombings, shootings, arson attacks. Before I went down there, I heard about the public beheadings in the streets. It's a very horrifying situation. So I traveled to the conflict zone visited the Buddhist monasteries. This is an example of one of these right there. It's a Buddhist monastery that was militarized, um, that was affected by the violence. And when I first went down there, I was going to all these militarized Buddhist temples. And the insurgents that were there fighting wanted to know, why was this white guy going to these militarized areas? And. Uh, I found out through a contact that someone had put a hit on me. Because <laughs> um, I thought that was working for the CIA. So uh, I had to escape, more or less, at that point. Shortly thereafter, I had my, uh, one of my co-workers, research assistant, she, she called for a ticket on a public bus, said she was going to go in there. I went in there, hid undercover, and got out of there. Um, but after I left, I thought about this. I'm like, you know, this. This information is important, though. What's happening in southern Thailand? And, and journalists are risking their lives day in and day out. How can I, who wants to pursue academics, is supposed to prize the idea of pursuit of knowledge, risk any less? So I decided to take out a half million dollar life insurance policy and go back. Um, when I got back, I was taking this very van, in fact, they had vans like this. About a, shortly a month afterwards, that same van was attacked. Um, insurgents had killed every single person in there. Uh, it was random killings. Um, 
Well, these were insurgents, um, Malay Muslims attacking uh, the area, but they were attacking Muslims and Buddhists alike. It didn't matter. Um, and I was feeling very sensitive to the fact that I could be the next person because I had had a hit put out of me. I'd given it about a year time in between, but nonetheless, I was worried about this. But I lived day in and day out. I still have that very bad. This is my belt that I'm wearing today, right there. Um, Slept. It's very hot. They don't have air conditioning, but you have a fan that blows. That way, the mosquitoes don't bite you when the fan's blowing on you. Tip for those who ever go to hot, humid climates. Um, but I decided to live with these monks and observe what was happening. And each day was vivid to me, filled with fears, insights about myself, about my colleagues, the people I'm working with, about what I was seeing on the ground. Very powerful experiences. I usually don't show pictures of myself, of the work I'm doing here, but I think it's important to reflect on this. I mean, during this intense period, I learned more about myself and those around me. And it was perhaps this intensity of the experience that demanded me to have time to, to process all this. Uh, for it's taken me years to parse out the lessons from my experience of what I call now death's door. So, getting then to the lessons, right? What is it having to deal with death in an intimate way? I mean, today I, still, I suffer from PTSD from the event itself. I have certain triggers from this. In fact, just ruminating over this topic is triggering me. Talking about it triggers me. I think part of the importance, though, is what we have fears is to work with them. So I think it's healthy that I am working with it. Um, but I decided to, to share with you a few um, thoughts that I've been able to, to come up with, uh, that I've accrued from my time spent in the conflict zone and, and dealing with these atrocities. And I'd like to add, too, that I was really privileged when I did this research. I could leave when I wanted to. I chose to go back. Uh, the people down there and the people who are still there, they don't have those choices. Um, so I'm not, I don't want to say that uh, the, the experience I have, the insights I have are unique or more important than not, but I, nonetheless I think they, they would be helpful to pass along. The first of these, and I hope that we can give us some, to some time to chew on it, and I'd like to again hear your thoughts on this, is to periodically meditate on dying. The experience, what I had to face, which I didn't, I guess, think about at the time, uh, was instructive on a level. In a controlled environment, so I'm not telling you to go to conflict zones. No, not at all. But if you can do a meditation in a controlled environment, I think these reflections are therapeutic to our living. And what does this mean? It means Letting yourself sit with your fear of death. Embrace that fear, accept the fear. Fear doesn't get more powerful when we talk about it. It doesn't get more influential when we embrace it. It goes away. Fear grows by hiding it, putting it aside. Which again, I think what we've been doing in Western society so much about that, we've been doing, we've been empowering it by refusing to acknowledge and work with it. When you feel a, what Freud calls a death drive, a fear creep over you, this might be a time for you, what I call, to empty the garbage, so to speak. You've been filled up with this. And re examine your finitude. Regardless of whether you believe in an afterlife or a rebirth, your time in this world, in this body, is limited. Devote five minutes a week, I'm saying only five minutes. Find a quiet place to sit. Focus on your breathing. Making sure to routinize your breathing in and out in a slow and even rate. For these five minutes, Think about your mortality and allow your thoughts and fears to flow through you. Make sure 
to exhale slowly while doing this. Because what we now find in neuropsychology is that the exhalation is what helps calm and soothe us. And often when we get concerned or fearful or traumatized, we actually start holding our breath. We don't let it out. So work on this when you're doing this for five minutes. I think it will help release the fears, decrease the way that your fears might be impacting you on a day-to-day -day basis. The second of these is that the more, t more time and activities to being kind to yourself. And I know it sounds like a platitude if I say it that way. So much, I think, of our society right now is built upon anger and loathing against the self. I cannot underscore how much of this. So I know right now we're, our society is faced with so many issues of sexism and racism and classism and discrimination. There's also one about the self, though, too, that we've had for a long time, self-loathing. I've observed, the hatred I've observed around me, the conflict zone, came from fears, but it also stemmed from a lack of warmth and kindness to themselves. People ate, slept, worked with their fears and angers. This only fed more animosity. We now know from psychology that our turn to smoking, overeating, Drug abuse and other addictions often stem from self-loathing. That's how it begins. And our inabilities to accept ourselves. Whenever we fail to create boundaries to protect ourselves, our time, our emotions, this leads to problems in life. I really think this is a key thing that I want to emphasize, creating boundaries for yourself. That's a way to be kind. And this could be not just boundaries for not doing too much work, but too much partying. Is that good for you? Is that nice to you? Do you deserve more sleep? Do you need more sleep? Question anything you feel compelled to do, if it's primarily due to fog, I like that acronym, if it's primarily due to fear, if it's primarily due to an obligation, if it's primarily due to guilt. I'm not saying these things aren't involved in decisions, but if one of these is your primary reason for doing this, why are you doing it? Are you being kind to yourself? One of the instructive measures that we're now seeing for Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, self-help groups, is their ways to help their members realize their own sense of agency, that we can choose to not allow our life to take control of the reins, that we can create boundaries. We have the agency to say when and how. And I think that oftentimes when we fail to do this repeatedly, we end up needing these reminders. So, Devote a block of time to something that makes you happy once a week. You deserve it. Do it. And I'm not talking about spending money on yourself. Do you need a walk? Is there a friend you haven't talked to in a while? Do you really like to just sit in those comfortable shoes for a while and just sit there? Do it. Give yourself some time. We're constantly budgeting time for other people, for other needs. Why are we not budgeting time for ourselves? The third, I'm not going to hit you with too many, I promise. I'm just going to give you three. I figure it's easier, it's more consumptible to give you three. Is to focus your time and energy on processes instead of goals. And I think that's a really important distinction. When I was a teenager, I was subsumed with the goals of getting married, uh, getting a job, buying a house, should have a fence, apparently, in my vision before, having children, right? This is this, this sort of narrative, I think, that we have in our country right now. Um, 
a very heteronormative uh, vision, too, for this, for that matter. Uh, but this has this been the sort of American dream. And it promises in this dream a reward at the end. Right? Retirement. That's what you get at the end. Um, now, what I've discovered, though, talking to people, observing things over time, is that uh, there's a hitch in this narrative. This is several hitches, but I want to focus on one of those. I have met so many people who are frustrated in their retirement. Either it's not what they expected, or they find it's now not what they wanted, because they haven't found a way to transition. We become what we do. If we work tirelessly to save enough money to retire, we'll become workaholics. How can we enjoy the not working? Think about it. I mean, the goal of my work in the conflict zone was getting information for my dissertation. But it was a process of living in the conflict zone that gave me PTSD and my outlook on life. And once I got the dissertation, I have a new goal, right? Get a job. I have a new goal, get tenure. There's always another goal after that, but we're not paying heed to the process. I would recommend that you choose your employment not only for its long-term benefits, but also for what it provides you in the process of doing it. I mean, you're, you're shaped by what you do, day in and day out. If you, if you appreciate what you do every day, if you find meaning in that work, this helps you reconcile your death much more than your goal. If this man dies, here, he hasn't reached this one. If he's reached this one, he hasn't reached that one. Your joy and happiness is only in the moment of achieving that goal, if you're goal-oriented. And I'm not saying don't try to strive for things, you should, but find enjoyment and meaning out of the process of getting to the goals. That way, this man dies here, he's found meaning, he's okay. He doesn't need the next one to make his life meaningful. Now, of course, I mean, these short reflections are not meant to be exhaustive or comprehensive. Certainly they're not, right? Rather, I envision that these three suggestions offer, I think, a wide relevance, probably an easy application, and are yet, I think, the hardest to actualize. In pursuance of these, I like to cap things off if I can with another story. Now, my initial story was about an old man with a wheelbarrow. And it was intended to underscore, underscore the importance of perspectives, right? How do we look at our lives? How do we look at the meaning of our lives? Um, and asking you to take a circuitous route, looking at death, seeing that that might be a way of seeing your life in a different way, seeing the meaning of your life in a different way. Now, in this story, in the story of thievery, we find the puzzle is solved by looking at what is most visible and prominent, but yet appears the most prosaic and ordinary. It's just a wheelbarrow. And I'd say this is the point I'm trying to argue too when it comes to life. It's, it's there right in front of us, our finitude. Um, our lives and death are continually mundane to us that they're not new or distinctive issues. But to address our lives' dilemmas, we may need to adopt different perspectives. Now, in Chinese and Japanese Buddhist traditions, there are collections of what are called mondos, dialogues between teachers and students. These mondos are used to stimulate us to think in a new way. I think one is particularly helpful for us in reflecting on our daily lives. But unlike the first story I told, 
I'm not intending to explain it. Um, the, uh, the goal for these stories has often been to spark an epiphany, an idea from you, by ruminating, thinking about it. So an explanation goes against that rumination. The point is that to ponder it, chew on it. And I'm going to tell you a story and you go forget about it, Dr. Jerry, so I'm done with it. That's okay, it's your prerogative. But this is why I'm not going to unpack it, though. I'm just simply going to give you the short story and have you think about it. And afterwards, I do would like to hear your thoughts and questions on why I presented it. Because for me, whether it's my last lecture or first lecture, I find the most redeeming qualities of a talk not to simply be my thoughts, but your responses and your questions. Because that collectively makes, I think, a holistic conversation and makes it the most fruitful. All right. So, here is the mondo. A monk, said the Josho, I have just entered the monastery. Please, teach me. Have you eaten your rice porridge? Asked Josho. Yes, I have, replied the monk. Then, you had better wash your bowl. Now I realize it's not necessarily what you expected to have to ask questions or have comments, but for me, I find it incredibly valuable, and I think it would be valuable for anybody else here. So please, if you do, I'd appreciate it. Do you see yourself as a Buddhist? That's a great question. Do I see myself as a Buddhist? You know, for, and again, I'm trying to think of this, this is my last lecture. What would I be saying? So I used to reframe from disclosing my religious identity because I felt it was so unfair and teaching different religions in a classroom, I would be biasing students on my preference. They go, oh, doctors teach these different religions, they each chosen this one. Um, at the same time, I always thought back in my head, but you're not being transparent about your bias. Everyone has a bias. All your teachers, all your professors have a bias. We all have an agenda, <laughs> we do. I have an agenda with this talk, obviously. Um, and getting to the next question, though, too, about my identity. So I thought in this recent age, where I think it's harder for people who have marginalized identities to speak out, I felt I have a responsibility to do so. So I revoked my decision to not talk about my religious identity starting this fall. I'm still finding it difficult to talk about it publicly, but if it's my last lecture, I need to do so. so I identify as a pedestrian, so not a Buddhist. What do you mean by pedestrian? What's that? What do you mean by that? Well, this is what's great. Somebody it, who's walking through life? Okay, good. So oftentimes in our society, I think we're conditioned by the most dominant religions that we have around us growing up, which is largely Protestant Christianity. I know this area is Catholic and Greek Orthodox as well. And it's always focused then on thinking of religion as an institution. So when you ask what religion you are, you're thinking what, what institution is it, right? What system? Is it Christianity, Judaism, Islam? These sort of groupings, these systems. Um, but religion is so much broader than this. Um, it doesn't need an institution at all. Uh, we've had fantastic examples of religions from yogis who reject their uh, any institutions to mystics and shamans and so forth. Um, I came into pedestrianism when I was just graduating college in 1996. And I met a pedestrian, asked them about it, and they explained to me. I was like, oh, there's no institution for it. There's no doctrine for it. Um, I found a website at one point, talked about it. I had a different opinion about what it was, talked to the person. I met one pedestrian when I was abroad overseas, so I haven't met that many. Um, but if you're asking me to articulate what it is, and for this too, I'd say that it's very hard for anybody to articulate their particular religious ideas if you press them on it. Uh, 
it's kind of like what you're saying too. The idea is one who walks. So the idea is to not fixate on that which is beyond what you can continue to observe. And by that, I recognize is myself. I'm constantly changing as well, but I'm constantly able to observe myself in these changes. And it's the belief that as we're walking through life, we're always bombarded by distractions. What about this? What about this? And we're losing track of listening to ourself as we're in the process of moving through life. So the first request uh, for what practice is to listen to yourself. Figure out what is important to you. Often the analogy given is like your body knows what you want when you want to eat food. If you listen to it carefully, you'll you crave a certain protein or a certain vitamin. But you take in all these different artificial flavors and colors, you start getting those other um, artificial cravings. And it's harder to listen to your body. And I think if you really listen to yourself, though, you can learn to what is important, what resonates morally, ethically. Now, I've talked to people in Los Angeles at one point and said, oh, you're a, you're a Zen master. I've talked to Muslims say, oh, you're, you're a Sufi. I've talked to Christians say, well, you're just listening to the soul. You're talking to God. People can call it whatever they want. It's fine. Um, I don't mind them framed in that way. Um, but the goal is to listen to yourself and try to live your life with that. And so in pursuit of this, when people ask me, do I believe in a God? It doesn't matter to me because that's beyond myself. Do I believe in heaven? I'm not focusing on that right now. I'm focusing on trying to observe the here and now with myself as I go through life and live it to the best I can be. That's being a pedestrian. Ordinary, I wouldn't give this. Feels, I feel uncomfortable doing this right now, but it's my last lecture, and so I will try to respect that and, and provide it if this was my last lecture. So that would be the answer to that question there. Yeah, Nick? I just had a question. Uh, being that you're overseas and you know, I haven't done a lot of traveling. And I guess probably about the, you know, you said you might have had like, a little bit of PSD. And uh, my, my mother, she worked at a bank. And she had a Jewish friend of hers, and he was retiring. He was going back to Israel. She looked at him one day, and she says, she goes, I can't see how you want to go back with all the violence and everything that happened. He just looked at it and he says, Franny, you must understand that because it's a way of life. So being that you're over there and that you've dealt with these monks, how did the monks deal with the people over there with everything that was going on and what did they tell them? Yeah, what was their philosophy on I know I know what you just told us. Yeah. Okay. But like you said, they didn't have they didn't have a way out. Right. And it, it may be the same thing as somebody here in the inner city that can't get out that lives in Harlem or in New York City. Right. Um, you know, where they live at today here. You know, they, they, they see that. So I'm just curious what their philosophy was it compared to what you may see people saying here, like a social worker or even some religious figure here in the United States. That's a great question, Nick. So how do the monks see being in the conflict zone? Um, a lot of them left, first off. A lot of the well-to-do left the area. Um, shortly after the violence. It's been going on since 2004, so we're now looking at 13 years worth, right? Um, those who stayed either couldn't leave financially or felt an obligation, and I think it's your question too, right? What was the obligation? So um, someone said, look, I am a, I mean, historically speaking in Thailand, monks were the community leaders. In fact, they used to have Muslims and Buddhists and Christians come to the monastery as a community event. It wasn't just about promoting a religion, and they felt and they were there to help out with being a counselor. Because we don't really have a robust uh, therapy, psychology in Thai society. You went to the monks for this. Um, if you need to have an exorcism, you go to the monks for this. Uh, you need help with some healing, go to the monks for charities. Go to the monks. So they felt like by leaving here, they're, they're leaving the people who need them the most. Um, but they were terrified. I mean, one. Abbott's, I was in his goodie, his, his, his quarters, he slept with a gun. Um, and I think this helped me understand that the way we've fantasized other religions that we're not familiar with, we often sanctify and idealize, and these are people. 
In fact, you know, most monks in the world, they don't go through a process like we do for seminary for Christianity or rabbinical school for Judaism. You get your blessings from your parents. You tell the, the monastery you, you got the okay. Next week, you get your head shaved. You go through the ceremony today, and you're now a monk. So what has changed about the person, really, except for the intention? Um, and so they, they have the same fears as, as other people, I think, do. Um, and uh, yeah, some of them felt like this was an obligation. Some of them felt, too, it was a fight. They thought that Buddhism was under attack by Muslims and that they needed to stay here and, and corral the troops and, and protect them. I talked to military monks that were down there. I have a whole book on that. But, um, um, but yeah, some of them felt like it was their civic obligation. Some felt like this was the only thing they knew. I saw on the other hand. I think it's a great distinction. Self-indulgence versus self-care. I was deliberating over using an image of Atlas at one point in this talk. I, got, I didn't have a lot of time to create this talk, but I had this whole idea of showing Atlas and saying, don't be Atlas. Because um, you know Atlas is holding up the whole world. I think constantly we're doing this. We're holding up all the burdens and, and challenges all the time. Uh, I discarded giving the image at one point, but um, it gets the idea. I'm not saying not to be compassionate to other people. That's important. Well, I find it interesting that we're, it's easy for us to be compassionate to others, but not be compassionate to ourselves. Um, so self-indulgence gets more to, I think, cravings, which actually, I think, aren't kind to ourselves. And that's where I think we have to start thinking about what are we after? What, what will be nice for us in the end? I could be up late at night wanting to play video games, like, well, it's five or four o'clock in the morning now. I've got to get up in five hours, but I want to play more video games. It's self-indulgence, but is it kind to me? Am I being compassionate to myself? I obviously need sleep. We know sleep is the most important thing for dealing with stress, um, for dealing with your immune, helping support your immune system, and so forth. So, absolutely. So, I guess the distinction we made is in terms of. You know, is the primary thing that you're pursuing this for because of a craving or because of self-care? That would be, I guess, how I distinguished it. But uh, I'm not a philosopher, and those people are great at, at distinguishing things in very fine ways. You know, I've, I've been really thinking about that, Jake, because it, it's so interesting to me how things are so counterintuitive. We, we have these sort of instincts, and then we naturalize and think, well, that's the way it should be. Uh, you know, we don't want to talk about things that we should, probably shouldn't talk about these things. But I mean, there's so much, I think, physiologically we have, for example, that's natural that we have to intervene with, whether it's picking out earwax or other things. We're constantly intervening because we need to do so. Um, and. In terms of, I guess, Western society, I mean, you think about how we handle fear, how we handle anger, depression. I mean, the first thing you do when you're depressed, what should you do? You, you should talk to others, reach out, but the instinct is to not. And by not doing, we intensify the problem. I mean, I'm just taught, I just found out about a, a faculty member here who got denied tenure. He's devastated right now. Devastated. Um, I believe that the ruling was completely unfair. Uh, his family's devastated because when you deny a professor tenure, that means all the years in schooling they had. I mean, I had 10 years of graduate school. <laughs> and then I had six years before I got tenure, which is longer than any sort of medical profession, by the way, for doing this, right? But when you get denied tenure, it means you won't get hired anywhere else, probably. That's a career death, more or less. Um, it's an entire nightmare. The person's first instinct was not to talk about it. 
right? Shame. And they go, hold on, this is important. We've got to talk about these issues. Why turn in? And so I think your question is partly too, like, why in the West do we have these issues about death where others don't? Um, and I think oftentimes religion or society can provide habits or routines that push against those instincts. And I think some, we have some in here that are helpful and some that are not. I attended, for example, a, a funeral and participated in a Jewish Shiva service, which was really interesting. I had never done this before. The idea is to, to um, cover all the mirrors. You don't want any reflections of yourself. You don't shave, you don't bathe. So you don't want to smell kind of bad. Um, and you're supposed to sit the whole time in one area and converse with other people who come to visit and bring you food and talk about the person who died. And I was like, this is idiotic, but okay, I'll do it. I'll just, fine. And I went ahead with this. Um, and it, it was hard. I felt uncomfortable at times, too. And if one, I don't like, for me, I just don't care for facial hair. Um, but afterwards, when I drove home, I remember I was in the bathroom and I was shaving. I, was, I started weeping as I was shaving. But then after I was off, it was like the sadness had left me. And then I realized the entire time I spent during that Jewish practice of Shiva, it was so different than any other normal day-to-day -day activity I had. It had completely distinguished itself from anything else. I couldn't associate that grief with anything else. I could leave it behind. And so in this example, there's a practice that encourages people to embrace, to confront grief. Um, but we don't have, in I think, a lot of Christian or Jewish traditions right now, ways of confronting the impending death. Like Buddhism, there is. Uh, it's one of the first noble truths. Life is suffering. Ah. Um, and Hinduism, too, has a lot of this. So, I mean, that's the distinction we can see that, and by the way, by this, I don't mean that it can't be this way. There isn't this way. Religions are fluid. They're diverse. There are historically Christian traditions that do this. Um, and we can change and put these things into play. But I think it's an explanation for why we right now suffer so much from it. Being one of the older ones in this room, and I am a lot older than a lot of you, so I've watched a lot of friends recently head there. So I was raised a Catholic, and then I went and studied I thought I was a Buddhist because my friend became a Buddhist and became a monk. So I, I think when you're talking about pedestrian, you may be talking about people that you have had the luxury of learning from all these other spiritual guide people. So maybe you're like the, the person in the candy shop who can't decide which one because you learned a little bit from every one of them. And I think that what I believe is that there's something else out there. I think religion would not exist if, if all these thousands of years people hadn't sensed something like you know you, you know you, good luck bad luck you know you just the, the brick falls it doesn't hit you but we sense that something's there and all these religions seem to try to define it so my theory is try to avoid it at all costs so i ride a bike i cook my own food try I, to avoid what the lucky way you trying to avoid the end. I, mean, the end. I, I don't and the thing is the only thing i do do is i do and I do try to talk to people that have gone beyond because they may be here in another plane. I just don't know who they are. And I've talked to physicists and psychiatrists and psychologists and brain surgeons about, you know, is there another plane here? We're just not, we, we don't have the senses to perceive it. So I don't not believe that there's something else out there. So my, the philosophy I got was from my daughter who supposedly quoted Elvis Presley. Surely quoting someone else. They said the secret to a good life is someone to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. I think those are all great and so suggestions. I so, I mean, um, I, and I, I understand that the need to try to keep active. Um, and I don't mean it all to be a sort of Eeyore tell you you should be focusing on the negatives of life or death. Not at all. I guess what I'm trying to suggests is that it's there, whether we like it or not, in the backs of our minds. And that when there's a death in the family, or I mean, I had a seizure last week, I mean, any sort of thing that happens to you can trigger what's already active in your brain, in your consciousness. And so if it is there, and if it is influencing us, like Heidegger has said, Freud has said, and Bataille and many others have said it is, 
then we can either actually work on ways to diminish the negative influence it has on us, which would be, again, when it comes to fear or sadness, you diminish its effects by talking about the sadness and talking about the fear. That makes it less. Anger, jealousy, lust, the more you talk about it, the more you make it worse. So there's some emotions actually we do want to, I think, minimize, but I don't think fear is. I think fear is one that we should titrate in a controlled environment ways to address and, and confront. Because I really firmly believe that we inhabit it. And if it's like you're saying, pursuing it through a particular religious vocation, that's great. Um, through the idea of active life, that's wonderful too. Whatever works for you. And again, here's my religion, we're coming out, right? Trying to promote what's good for you. Um, but I really believe this. Whatever works for you is that case. But I don't want to, I guess, make this into a which religion or other religion in this case. Because I think the point, though, is confronting our fears. Oh, but so we just want to make sure we provide time for other people here, though. Don't know what's going to happen. Right. But my point, though, is not about knowing what's going to happen, but I think it's the fear of not knowing, not being able to process that is the problem. Yes? Uh, actually, a quick question on something um, in a class of yours from last year. You talked about Intro, uh, yes. Um, um, anthropology and like a guy who was working in a tribe, and when they had a funeral, they didn't, like it was, I, I don't remember if it was shameful, but it wasn't acceptable to grieve. And they were supposed to just kind of remain silent and go about their day after, like, after it occurred. And like he even asked one of them, they said that they were sad, but they weren't supposed to show that they were sad. So does it show like a cultural similarity, mm -hmm. even though its expectations are different in other cultures? Yes, it's a similarity. It's also the question is, what do you see death to be? And by that I mean, I mean, there's a whole great work by, uh, called the, the Left Hand by Hertz talking about cultural ways of even understanding death. Um, for example, the, the King of Time was just, they just did a survey just recently, but he physically died about six months ago. We would medically, us in the Western world say, he was dead back then, but for them they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> he's, he's dead now. Others believe that it takes a while even after the body stops to finally die. So the question is going to be, what do you see death to mean? Right? And it could be for not saying, don't be sad, thinking that it's not a finality. Right? In, in indigenous African beliefs, there was the idea of the living dead. It's a transition from one chapter to the next. It's not an end of anything, it's just the next chapter. Kind of like going from childhood to adolescence and adolescence to adulthood, and then afterwards you, you go on to being a living dead, and you go on to being an ancestor. and. So to show sadness or grief is to misplace what's actually happening. So there's distinctions and nuances in all these, I think, in play. And what I think is going back to Jacob's question, though, is in the Abrahamic faiths, right, there's a clear sense of death um, and that is right in line, I think, with Western medicine, with the body dying this way. And this abruptness, I think, in many ways, for, for sometimes it's abrupt. And there isn't, though, this way of coping with that finality that's going to happen. By the way, if you disagree, it's completely fine. I invite that. I think it's important for us to, to hear alternative views on this. Um, anything else? Well, reincarnation or rebirths, uh, I know it's popular in uh, Western society with a lot of new religions, the idea of reincarnation. I know that a lot of the ideas about reincarnation that we take in this country come from Asian and African religions that believe in this. Uh, one thing to note is that most of the religions beyond the West that believe in rebirth and reincarnation don't think it's a great thing. They're not like, I can do this all over again. That's not good. They don't want to keep coming back. Um, they want to get to the next level. Um, so for them, and also the idea of YOLO doesn't make sense to these people either because it's like, well, no, no, you don't live only once. It's, you keep 
unfortunately doing it again and again to get it right. Um, I mean, I think there are a lot of interesting arguments in favor of rebirths uh, and reincarnation. Um, but I, this is what I really find, though, is that um, for me, whether I study with Buddhists or Hindus or Christians or Jews, I find powerful, profound experiences for these people to legitimate what they believe. Each and every community has powerful things, and each community seeks now the sciences to legitimate and support their particular views. But for me personally, it's beyond me as a pedestrian to think about this, so I really don't have a position on it. I, I read a book by a real Kushner one time. He, he talked about uh, the Buddhist Buddhism and he kind of said, you know, it's kind of like taking a suit off, but taking a set of clothes off and putting it back. You know, you get a new set of clothes, get it, male, female, you know, whatever it is. But I, I know in his viewpoint, he says, because I'd rather be a Christian and have one chance. He says, it makes me try harder in life. There because we go. I know I don't have that second chance to come back. He says, it's just a different philosophy. Good, but in this he's sense, Jew, he's Jewish. But I think it's great that you bring it to the point because I think for the person writing, I think they're mistaken about how they understand rebirths on the other end. So people, for example, in India or Burma or China would not think that they get to come back again. No, 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 no. You get reborn, but you don't remember your past life. That's, that's over. So there's the same fear of the, of the losing of your particular identity. That's over, unless you reach a higher stage. Um, and so you also have those equal drives to live life to the fullest, to be good. Not only because uh, your life will end is how you know it, but you also want to get good stock for the next life if you're not going to be able to go and elevate because most other religions dictate that what you do in this life determines what you'll be in the next life. You could be a cockroach. You could be a fly. Um, I, mean, I got yelled at when I was in Mongolia. I used to always, I had all these flies about me. I was always swatting the flies and people were like, oh, the way I say no, no, Michael, don't do it. I'm like what? Like these, you can't. This could have been your mother from her life. I'm like ah. So I mean, we don't. The whole thing is you don't know, but you want to make sure you do good now, the best you can, because if you don't get to go to the next level, then you want to make sure you're in a good setup for the next life. So there's that. So they just there's bonuses of both sides looking at this. Is what I'm trying to say. Uh, how are we doing with time? Okay, so I don't want to keep you longer because I know you have other things to do. Thank you so much, though, for this opportunity and for your interest in this last lecture. Why is this your last lecture? What's that? Why is this your last lecture? Because this is what I was nominated to give in the last lecture. Oh, I'm serious. So this is not like you're not leaving, going to another planet or anything. I'm not leaving and going to another planet, no. <laughs> Thank you, though, everyone. <laughs>